Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, good afternoon or good evening for uh, some of you. Um, I my name is Liz Yada. I work for the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, part of um, Open Education Global, and so glad you could all join us today. Um, if you haven't already, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and use the chat to ask any questions when the presentation gets going. Um, next slide, Laura. And if you're not familiar with the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, we're a, a community of practice and we've got member um, community college members across the U.S. and Canada. Um, we have 101 members, although that represents a lot more um, uh, colleges than just 101. For example, we have the community college, the chancellor's office in California, and they have 116 um, campuses. Um, and so if you want to learn more, um, visit our website or look at the Become a Member page. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, Laura. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Uh, our agenda for today is as follows. We're already a few minutes into our warm welcome to you all. Uh, over the next few minutes, uh, James and I will be going over exactly what OFAR is, our program overview. And then Gayatri Manakandan, one of our beloved coaches, will be taking a deep dive into what is anti-racist pedagogy in the classroom based on her experience as both a practitioner and now a coach for OFAR. Uh, and then we will look over some current research and what next steps are. Uh, and then we will conclude this afternoon, this evening, or this morning, wherever you are, uh, this panel discussion with the Q&A lightning round. Uh, so who we are, um, I'm Laura Dunn, the co-director for Open for Anti-Racism. I'm also the director of assessment and writing programs at Santa Clara University. Uh, James is my co-director at Open for Anti-Racism. He's also the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Learning at College of the Canyons. Gayatri Manakandan is, as I mentioned earlier, one of our beloved OFAR coaches and a previous OFAR uh, participant. She's a professor of math, a math instructional specialist, and a student success center and professional development liaison at Compton College. So what we hope you'll walk away with today is a framework for defining anti-racist pedagogy, as well as a better understanding of how open education can support anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, we'll also go over some key outcomes for the OFAR program. And let me say a few brief words about the origins of the Open for Anti-Racism program, or OFAR. Um, the OFAR program began or, uh, in the spring and summer of 2020. For those of you familiar with the United States context, you'll recall the horrific murder of George Floyd, along with many other African Americans. Uh, and just another in the long lines of, of, uh, of abuses. Um, but the uh, attention that that murder and other murders uh, garnered and the kinds of conversations that were sparked by, by those tragic events sparked a reflection uh, in many parts of U.S. higher education on what uh, higher education could do uh, to uh, counter racism or become anti-racist. And what we found, we, uh, myself and our, my then co-director and co-conspirator, Una Daly, recently retired, um, we reflected uh, that, um, or what we were hearing from faculty colleagues in our setting in the California Community Colleges was that faculty would like to do something, would like to do more to make their teaching anti-racist, to uh, figure out how they could respond uh, to the to the reflections that they were going through or what they were learning. Um, but despite many, many, many statements by institutions that they were going to make themselves anti-racist somehow by putting putting a statement in their strategic plan or putting a statement on their website, not a lot of practical support was forthcoming. So Una and I, from our positions deeply embedded in the open education movement, uh, believe that uh, 
open education, open pedagogy, open educational resources could provide tools to help faculty uh, make their teaching anti-racist. We approached uh, the Hewlett Foundation, uh, the amazing, thoughtful, supportive uh, program officer for OER there, uh, Angela DeBarger, uh, helped us craft, uh, further develop, refine our idea. Uh, and out of that, OFAR was born. Uh, you see our premises here on the slide that faculty want to make their teaching anti-racist, but they need information tools and a safe place to learn. And secondly, that open education can offer tools to help faculty make their teaching and their, their materials anti-racist. And one more prefatory word about our context. Uh, the context for OFAR at present is the California Community Colleges. Uh, that's where Una and I have done most of our work. Um, California Community Colleges are open access institution. we, institutions. We proudly accept the top 100% of applicants to our, to our colleges. And uh, we are the largest system of higher education in the world. Uh, 116 colleges serving 2 million students. Uh, and with that context, I'm going to pass it back to you, Laura. Thanks, James. Um, so the, the OFAR program uh, every year puts out a call for participation throughout the California community college system. And so this year we have seven schools uh, and James, you can jump in and correct me if I'm getting the numbers wrong and 44 participants across those schools who are enrolled in this program um, led by our amazing team of coaches. So in the program, uh, Participants explore how to use OER and open pedagogy to make instructional materials and teaching more anti-racist. And there are pillars uh, for doing this, such as learning about anti-racist pedagogy, OER and open pedagogy in a facilitated online course on Canvas. Uh, then participants who are faculty members develop and implement an action plan for their courses. So this all starts in the fall, the course, the facilitated online courses in the fall, and then in the spring, they implement their action plans in collaboration with their students. Uh, throughout the year, our participants benefit from peer connections. Uh, we host monthly webinars with uh, influential speakers. We offer coaching and administrative support. At the end of the year, uh, participants document the impact of OFAR through surveys and interviews and record student outcomes as well. So before we uh, get into the deep dive with Gaia Tree, uh, we'll look a little bit at what it means to, to do or, to con or what is anti-racist pedagogy. Um, and of course, anti-racism is um, a dynamic field. It's always changing. Um, but first, we understand that we need to be race, con race conscious, acknowledging our identity and social position, and recognizing that implicit bias exists. We think systematically and structurally to expose systemic and structural racism. We also examine the history of a particular discipline, ask how knowledge is defined and accepted, as well as asking who gets to have a voice in the discipline. We include voices and perspectives from many people and groups, and we also invite students to contribute their own perspectives and experiences. So with that, I will hand it over to Gayatri to talk about her experience and knowledge in OFAR. Thank you, Lara. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I first start, uh, came to know about this program. And then as a college, uh, we applied for this program. So I was, our college was luckily chosen. And then we get to participate in the 2022-2023 um, cohort. And literally loved doing this work and then I have an opportunity to coach this year. Um, so with that, I want to share a little bit about what I did through my participation and what work I'm doing in my class. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the first thing is when, before I started this program, I was using OER because our students really go through a lot of um, financial burdens, the textbooks are really expensive. So um, I said, okay, we have a lot of open educational resources available. So I I decided to make 
all my classes um, create my course structure based on this openly available textbooks. And then I, when I started this program, I get to learn about open pedagogy and anti-racist pedagogy. So slowly, uh, in, the, in the beginning, I thought I'm teaching math. How am I going to make this anti-racist or why is that related in my class? That's the feeling I had. But after going through this class, I understand uh, how I could incorporate these techniques into my class. So the, cl the subject, the statistics I chose that we offer um, many sections of elementary statistics course in our college. So I decided to use these practices to apply in the elementary statistics course. So next step is building the course, right? How do we bring these strategies into the statistics course? So, and my wonderful coach shared with me um, that there are already a lot of tools available that are created. So I came to know about this um, course created uh, to go with this openly available statistics book on OpenStax. So here are some example um, topics that are created in that course. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this is the course. So this course is created and it's available in comments for everybody to choose. So this is called Statistics for Social Justice. This course completely matched my textbook. That's the OpenStax textbook. And for each, ch each chapter, there was a topic related to the, um, so, like social justice topic related to uh, what we were learning. So this made it super easy for me to incorporate adopt. So that way I was able to easily um, bring in the concepts and that goes along well with the textbook that I was I was using. So, um, so the creation part becomes super easy. So I was able to integrate it and uh, talk about a lot of these topics in the class. So the first time I was a little bit like kind of saying, oh, do I make, how much time do the students spend in the class? on dealing with this or discussing with these topics besides statistics? Those are a few questions that I always um, have to deal with, especially the first semester that I was trying to put in this in my class. So I made this, some of these are optional. So we discuss and we say, oh, whoever interested, you can participate. So being making this like optional, um, I, I felt later it was not a best strategy, Rather, I would make it mandatory, but giving them like a following a pattern, like every week we just have a discussion on these topics. And, and since it's already integrated with the statistics book, it's totally, go it has a good flow. So those are some of the things that I learned that we have to have a pattern. It needs to be mandatory. And also before introducing this, just to make the students ease into these topics because some of these deal with police shootings and we just want to make sure the students are uh, comfortable in participating in these. So just walking them through or scaffolding these activities was really helpful in um, making the students understand why we are doing in the statistics class and why the topics are like, you know, number of people in prison or, and not only that, we just talk about a variety of topics in the scores and uh, bring, bringing in um, women and income, those kind of stuff. There is a lot of topics that relates and go well. So I just want to share this one with this because sometimes when, before we start, we feel that, um, you know, it's overwhelming. Like, you know, there is so much to do. How much am I going to do, right? But there are a lot of stuff that are openly available that we can take it and easily incorporate to um, whatever we are doing, like small little step that really makes a big change. So with that, um, bringing on OER, that's openly open educational resources and having it with an anti-racist pedagogy, I want to bring in the open pedagogy as well, where students kind of, um, 
co-create the things that we teach. So uh, can we go to the next slide? So I want to share this one activity. We can take this activity and do it in many different levels. So I'm just going to share one example where the students kind of co-create. Um, the. We can In the beginning of the semester, we can use this by creating a community norm. Or at the end of the semester, we can create the same activity as a wall of wisdom. So let me go through. I want to increase students belonging in the class. I want them to co-create work with my syllabus, building the community norms, et cetera. Sometimes at college, we think, oh, a college student should be behaving in certain way that the teacher kind of magically imagines they already know. But a lot of these norms are more, it's different with different cultures. So we just want to share transparently what we expect. What are the things allowed? What are the things not allowed? So in the beginning of the semester, using Canvas Wiki pages, so I created it's very, very um, simple, created this simple topic, how I can help the students in the class and what will they do as a student to do well in the class, right? So it's a Canvas Wiki page where students can click edit and enter whatever they want. I just kind of warn them not to delete other students' posts and also they can put their name at the end. Um, because I do count all the participation as like one point, something like that. So I want to know who, which students participate. So I track them by seeing who did the post, who participated, um, because my students don't do it. So I kind of make it optional, I mean, uh, mandatory, so I can track. So um, this is co-create the norms. The same idea can be applied for co-creating the syllabus as well. Also, at the end of the semester, they will be sharing some tips, some strategies that they use to be successful in this course. I call that as a wall of wisdom. So they shared it. I, I let them know that whatever strategies and tips they shared in the class, I will share that page with my next set of students so they will get an idea uh, from my previous class, what are the strategies and tips they used. So um, this is one activity we do together in the class and it really works well with all type of modalities, either online, hybrid and in-person. It works really well and, and, and students feel connected more because they have some freedom to do, um, things together so they their voice is being heard so they they feel more connection and and they take their responsibility to maintain whatever the norms that we create as a class um can we go to the next slide please so another important thing i learned is uh, providing the space for students um, for their reflection. So when I did these activities, for um, every every month we do a reflection, meaning what they got out of it, what they benefited, what are the confusions that they have still, and uh, we provide each other to As an instructor, it gave me um, how I could tweak the class um, so that way they all understand and um, learn better. So usually when we have student feedback at the end of the semester, that's too late for um, instructor to make any changes for the current class because they will be finishing that semester. So having these intermediate reflections where they can share um, helps the instructor and also helps the student because we can we can have the class more fluid so it's 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 like changeable like you know we can adjust things here and there um so we can immediately get what didn't work what confusions they have so that way uh we can tweak this stuff so providing this time for reflection that 
um, really kind of uh, helps the teacher and the uh, and the students. And I did notice that um, the students participate more on these kind of uh, assignments. Even sometimes if the student didn't finish the homework, but they are willing to share that, oh, something happened to this time and I couldn't do the homework. And doing small little changes like providing late passes in the class, accommodating students, like, you know, so those, those kind of thing really, really work well for the students uh, with their learning. And, and another thing I noticed is students are open to share. Uh, because they are not quiet, they are not like, you know, not participating. I saw that there is like an uh, increase in the participation and also um, they they felt the belonging. They, they, they like working with each other. They kind of helped each other on the discussion board with the mathematical questions, whatever they post, the other students will go, oh, this is how I solved it. Um, before these kind of practices, Students, if you have a question posted on the discussion board, like nobody would like to, you know, eagerly it and um, share their questions. Um, even though we talk about this growth mindset, it's okay to make mistake, all those stuff. But with these kind, of things, I do notice that many students kind of uh, there is a, a sense of belonging and a good community to help each other and learn. Um, with math, I feel many students have a fear of math, like anxiety. With, with this open discussion, that kind of helped them ease into math and ease into like the college setting. So um, I would say now I'm a coach. I would say I could share these with my, my team. And also, I'm really impressed with all these um, ideas my team members bring in. It's a constant learning, right? So we just make changes and make improvements uh, with whatever we do. I do want to tell you um, the webinars that we attended during our course, it was super helpful where the previous participant kind of shared with their creations and it encouraged us because in the beginning, I didn't know where to start. And then I attended these webinars, got a lot of ideas, and then I was able to tweak it. However, I was how much ever I was comfortable in and making changes at that time because we can't make the whole big flip over change thing. So it just needs to be like step by step um, so that we can adjust the flow and manage the um, manage the uh, concepts that we are teaching along with these. So I just want to share with you all, even one small thing that you can change that will br bring a big impact to your students uh, learning. And so I just want to share that with you all. And back to Laura. Thank you so much, Gayatri. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you, Gatri. I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the research pro program that we have around OFAR. But I just want to say, Gatri, how much I I really love your expansive uh, application of open pedagogy and understanding open education as much more than just a textbook. Right. It reminds me of the uh, saying by Robin DeRosa many years ago that she doesn't want to be a part of a movement that is focused on making a a static textbook free, right? That, you know, that's not really progress. You know, we can say the same thing about a textbook filled with white supremacy and misogyny. Just making that free is not really progress or it's not the progress that I want to make. So I really love your your welcoming uh, approach uh, there, Gayatri, and understanding that as part of open education. So as, as back, back to the program here, um, we are now in year four of our, of the OFAR program. And each year we uh, do a lot of research around the program to determine how it's going and what changes are actually happening uh, in the classroom and how we can improve the program. So we've got a complete research. We have complete research results for the first three years. We see on this next few slides, we're going to see some highlights of those research results. So first of all, uh, on this slide, you see that 100% uh, of our participants in year three uh, indicated that they were uh, using anti-racist and culturally responsive pedagogy. 
uh, as as exemplified by by Gayatri's examples, uh, 88 and a per, 88 and a half percent of our uh, participants called out open pedagogy specifically, and 88 percent of our participants in year one uh, told us that they were using OER, uh, and we we only have that from year one because we dropped that from the from the survey. We uh, uh, again, you know, wanted to. Uh, focus on more than just a free textbook and think more about uh, helping our participants engage in open pedagogy as a, as a step towards anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the, the, the research result that really warms up my heart. Uh, we introduced this question first in year three. We asked our participants bef at the uh, outset of the program, as well as at the end of the program, so the classic pre-test and uh, pre-survey and post-survey, uh, whether they felt confident discussing uh, racist, racism and anti-racism with their students uh, prior to the program. 28% of the participants indicated that they were confident in doing so, and after the program, 88.5% of participants indicated that they were confident or very confident in discussing racism and anti-racism with their students. So that uh, really warms my heart because that confidence, that self-confidence, that self-efficacy is something that I think probably remains more than just using a free uh, textbook. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, we also survey administrators from the participating colleges. So Gayatri mentioned that her college, Compton College, was selected. So we accept uh, applications from teams of participants at a college. Uh, we focus on teams for a number of reasons, including uh, we want the participants to have a bit of a support network within the institution, but we also hope to have an impact on the institution. So we ask the uh, applicant teams to provide a letter from a sponsoring administrator, a vice president, or a dean, for example. Uh, and we ask the lead of our participating team to check in with the administrator every once in a while, let them know what the team's doing, how's it going, and how can you be of help? Uh, Mr. Administ Mr. Administ Administrator. Uh, so when we survey the administrators uh, at the end of the program, 87% of the respondents said that they felt very engaged in the OFAR work. And 100% said they provided support to the team in one way or another, either giving professional development credit or helping helping lift up the teams by, by having them speak to the board, the governing board of the institution, or having them speak at, a, at an all-college meeting. So lots of great ways that our uh, administrators supported the, the supported the teams. Next slide, please. And we also survey the students in the classes in which our participants are making a change. Again, during the fall semester, our participants learn, they're participating in that Canvas course, and then in the spring, they're implementing a concrete change in their classes. So we survey the students in those classes. Uh, the, survey, the students tell us that 80, in 80, 88% of the students told us that they examined the history of their discipline, uh, going back to that question of how knowledge is created, whose voice is left out of, of a disciplinary uh, body of knowledge. 88.5% tell us that they always felt treated the same as other students in the class. Uh, and 82% told us that their thoughts and ideas are always valued the same as other students in that class. So uh, those are indications, that, going back to what Gayatri uh, mentioned about her class, indications that students felt included, uh, not only engaged, uh, but also included and reflected in the classes. Next slide, please. Well, and uh, here is our moment of discussion. Uh, Laura, I'm going to kick this back to you. Sure. Um, I think I'm actually just kicking it back to everybody um, to see if anybody has any questions for Gayatri, James, or myself about OFAR and anti-racism and anti-racist pedagogy. And, and, and how this could be applicable to your work and, you know, recognizing that many of you are from different contexts than uh, we're working in. How does this resonate in your context? So a nice reminder in the chat from L, of course, that open is more than textbooks and just as libraries are more than the four walls. Absolutely, L. Uh, so co comments, thoughts. Let me see if Trav is still with us. Trav, one of our previous participants, I know he couldn't stay long. He darn it, he had to leave. Um, I wanted to get a word or two from Trav. Um, 
any comments, questions from the group here? How how is how was the fall of 2020, spring of 2021 uh, handled at your institutions as far as your uh, college governing board or your senior administrators releasing press releases saying tomorrow the institution will be anti-racist? Was there any actual support for your for your your efforts, or was it just uh, uh, what I said it was? Did you were, was there any concrete support forthcoming for for those efforts on the part of the faculty or staff? You know, I want to share that when we applied, it's always the team was so good because we had a team of faculty in, from different disciplines and we were holding roundtable discussions and other faculty who are not part of O4 were able to join. We had a good support from our administration, so we were able to hold these and um, and and lot, we did a lot of showcase for them. We shared what we did with our um, other faculty from our college, it was well received. I think um, doing these work alone can be uh, very, very hard. And sometimes it may be depressing. I'm like, I'm the only one sitting there and talking all those stuff. But having the team, it really helps because you feel I'm not the only one. If you feel you are kind of the odd one out, then we start questioning ourselves, am I doing the right thing kind of stuff? So. We had like a um, few math faculty members working together on creating different activities. And then we share with each other. It's like uh, when a student take a class from mine to another instructor, they don't feel this instructor was super welcoming and the other instructor was not. We create a culture in the campus so that we accommodate everybody. Uh, we, their voices are being heard. So it's not just a one person movement, it's just creating a culture in your campus. So Guy, Guy Jay, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Uh, again, we're we're in year five or cohort five, I'm sorry, cohort four of OFAR. During the first year, we accepted applications from individuals. Uh, so we had many individuals from many, many colleges, but they were on their own. And uh we realized, as you said, that can be very isolating or difficult work. And in the first year, in fact, two of our participants brought to their attention, brought, brought to our attention, let's say the pushback or resistance that they were experiencing from students. Uh, uh, a, one, one participant told us outright that uh, they had white supremacist students in their class. Um, uh, another uh, participant told us that because of the discipline they were teaching, which is part of a multi-level series, some students thought that they would, were disadvantaged by not focusing on the essential elements that were of knowledge that were going to be applied across that entire series. Let's say, for example, you know, math one, two, three, or biology one, two, three, those, those types of sequences. And then another participant, in fact, told us that they had received uh, threats from the community on social media because they had publicly posted that they were participating in this program and so on and so forth and that they got yeah really ho horrible uh, response on social media. So in subsequent years, we uh, saw applications from a smaller number of colleges, but with more people. So there would be that support network. We also began asking the sponsoring administrators what supports do you have in place for your participant for your colleagues if they receive pushback so that it, the individual is not on their own just hanging out there we want the institution to say oh yeah we have this process or procedure with human resources or with with campus safety or something to to help support our participants if if you know really negative things happen we have a comment here in the chat from l she says that uh, our campus focused on the intersectionality of racial access and disability justice. Nothing about us without us was the theme of our roadshow that extended into embedding those ideas into OER material. Thank you so much, Al. And, and thank nice you, Al. Thank you, Al, for the reminder of well, the importance of intersectionality and uh, disability justice. Absolutely, positively. I see a hand up from from Madeline. Yes, I, I've been to several of these programs and I was so, I said, oh, wow, we should be doing this 
at our campus, right? And every time I try to start, it, it's hard to kind of move it forward. Um, but as I'm listening to this now, um, we're part of the City University of New York, another big mm -hmm. <laughs> institution. And I realized, no, this is not about just Ostos. This is about all of CUNY kind of banding together, as well as even SUNY. Um, we, we benefit both CUNY and SUNY from receiving funding for OER. So it, we 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 have a vehicle, we have the money to do it. We just have to collectively get together to do it. And like I said, every time I I come to these type of sessions, I'm like, this is what we should be doing. And and like you mentioned, James, what was happening on our campus? Yes, everyone reacted <laughs> to what what happened to George Floyd. You know, and all these statements went out. But well, what did we change? Exactly. And, that, and that press release is going to change the world, right? Yeah. And I was, I, you know, it's like, and yeah, we'll have, we'll have town halls because that'll fix the problem. Um, but it wasn't addressing the problem. And I think within the classroom, I think that's where the, that's where you can start addressing the problem. And, and, and I had a question for it and, and forgive me if I say your name incorrectly. Yeah. I I hope I said that. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering for your students, I wrote down this question, um, were they able to link what they were doing in your class with some of the other classes they were taking? Um, because no. it, it, is it crossed, I see that it crosses over. So I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, so, but that's a great question. I never asked the students how it kind of related with other courses they are taking. <laughs> Uh, all my feedback questions are based on my class. So we did this stuff, and then I ask, okay, how 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 you are doing with this class? But it's a great thing. I never thought, um, you know, well, there is a lot of like connections, right? They will see this in different classes, like say even ethnic studies or any, any other different classes that we they teach they take. There is a lot of overlap, but I never thought of this this question of asking my students how it kind of applies in their other classes. But now I, I know uh, for the next oh. time my students, I can open that question to them and then understand how it relates, how they feel, how comfortable they feel their classes also, because it's all multi-layered. It just all the concepts that go into their head mm -hmm. that come up as a pro, like, you know, they just their mindset how they behave, how they treat, or how they're, it, it just like a lot of metacognitive reflections goes through their head with all these kind of topics exposed in it. But um, yeah, that's a good one for me to keep it and ask for my, this set of students. So I would know how, I, I'm really now thinking how, how they will feel and I'm curious to know as well. Oh, okay, thank you. I was just, I was just curious, I was just curious, you know, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because I all my feedback was only about my class, so that's that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, Laura, I think back to you. I think we're we're yeah, looking at the clock that. here slowly. One more comment here in the chat from Jonathan. who says that Gayatri's presentation was really inspiring for a fellow mathematician. Hey, Jonathan, we often hear it's impossible to do anti-racist teaching in such abstract subjects. So I'd love to hear examples of how that's not true at all. Awesome. So true. Okay, so we are at um, 312. So we will move on here. So right now uh, we are underway in the middle of year or the spring semester of OFAR year four. Uh, uh, we encourage everyone to get involved if possible. Um, to OFAR year five, we accept uh, college team applications. Uh, if you're accepted, we provide in, uh, institutional support, um, look at student outcomes uh, and student leadership. Uh, there's a QR code here uh, for you to get on the list for our next call for participants. Go ahead and take a screenshot of that. And you can go ahead uh, and also take a screenshot of these resources here. 
Uh, to learn more about Open for Anti-Racism, our website is listed above, www.cccoer.org slash OFAR. Uh, you can also read uh, an impact story about OFAR here. I'm not going to read that out for you. So you can just take a screenshot. All right. Liz, Liz kindly put the put the link in the chat. Oh, she there, did. Thank you. Number of links in the chat there. Great. Awesome. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Liz uh, to give us some uh, important closing information. All right. Thanks, Laura. Um, so just uh, quickly, um, if you want to stay in touch um, with the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, we have our community email, which is a Google group that's been going on for more than 10 years. Lots of really wonderful OER practitioners on that list. Um, we also keep a running list of conferences coming up that are involved with open education. And so if you go to our website and go under the get involved menu, there's a, a, a spreadsheet. And we also have other things like e, uh, EDI blog posts and student or OER <laughs> impact stories on there. Um, next slide. And um, so this is the end of open education week, but next month we are going to have a webinar on um, AI and OER, which is obviously a pop big topic. I think I personally went to two different sessions this week on that. And I know I, there were more. And then in May, we're going to be exploring open education publishing platforms. Um, and then just we want to know what you thought. Um, this, this feedback survey is for all of CCC OERs. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, webinars this week, so let us know what you thought. And um, I think just what's left is to say thank you very much for attending. Oh, thanks, James, for putting the spring webinars in there. And um, we will see you online later. <laughs> well, and thanks, thank everyone. You. Yeah, and thank you, Liz, and thank you to CCC OER and all the CCC OER members. And if you're not a member, become a member. If you're not on the email list, get on that email list.